profound pleasure it is to be back here. Uh, this is, I think, the first time I have been uh, in New Haven for professional reasons in uh, 23 years. Uh, and if I, my memory is correct, the last time was for the final consultation with my dissertation advisors. And I, after that, I drove back to Washington uh, with the uh, only copy of my thesis in the trunk of a car, stopped for dinner in Manhattan, and when I emerged from dinner, discovered that the trunk of the car had been rifled with a crowbar, and a small bag was missing that contained some old clothes, a book or two, and the only copy of my dissertation. Uh, so I uh, got on the phone to, to Sid Winter, and I said, Sid, I want you to be on the alert. There is a distinct possibility that someone else will try to get a PhD awarded from Yale University on the same topic that I've been working on. Don't give it to him. At any rate, it really is uh, a profound pleasure to be here, and especially to have the opportunity to talk about uh, some work that I have been doing uh, with a uh, small and evolving group of graduate students, research students, in the PhD program in public policy at the um, LBJ School of Public Affairs, University of Texas at Austin, where I have now been for about 19 years. Uh, and this is work which uh, passes under the uh, rubric of something we call the University of Texas Inequality Project. Uh, most of it is available on the website of our uh, small group. Um, and in particular, I want to talk today about a body of work related to the measure of uh, economic inequality of several different kinds uh, at the global scale. And this is based in part on a paper uh, that a recent uh, PhD graduate and I, Hyun Sub Kum, have written, uh, which will appear in the January issue of the Review of Income and Wealth. The larger question uh, to which we are in part addressing ourselves uh, has been rather thoroughly described in uh, an intensely debated literature in recent months. Uh, and it is whether inequality uh, in the world in the age of globalization has been rising or falling. And it is now, of course, very well understood that there are basically three ways to approach this question. Uh, one of them, uh, and here I'm borrowing from the work of a former World Bank economist, Branko Milanovic. One of these ways is to uh, simply use a measure of uh, <coughs> income inequality between countries, uh, not waiting for population size. Uh, and when you do that using as your data source, let's say the Penn World tables, uh, everybody agrees that inequality has, in fact, been rising. But that agreement becomes considerably uh, muddied, or indeed contradicted, uh, if you wait by uh, population size because of the effects principally of China and also to some extent of India, which have been growing very rapidly, therefore rising in the uh, uh, <coughs> relative income distribution, and uh, in a weighted measure, reducing the inequality of incomes across countries. Neither of those questions, of course, gets to the, uh, uh, the, the deeper issue of what has been going on inside national boundaries, uh, which Milanovic would call the true within-country inequality measure, and that remains rather hotly disputed. You see a summary of, oh, the economist uh, in recent articles, actually on two occasions, has picked up a uh, 
little bit of an analysis that appeared in Stanley Fisher's Eli lecture in uh, 2003, uh, showing what happens if you uh, shift from an unweighted to a weighted distribution. This has got GDP per head on the horizontal axis and the growth from 1980 to 2000 on the vertical axis. And so you can see the implication of the top diagram is that the uh, richer countries have been growing faster and therefore you've had uh, divergence and an increase in inequality. And you can see how that conclusion would be uh, to some extent reversed if you weight by population because of the size of China and India and particularly so if you take out the uh, countries of sub-Saharan Africa which have had a particularly bad experience. Uh, on the other hand, if you look at measures of true inequality, attempting to take account of what's going on inside countries, you find what the, while there are a number of studies uh, that have attempted to get a grip on this question, uh, they have in almost all cases been only to able to do so for a handful of years, sometimes two, up to as many as four. Uh, this one is Milanovic's famous study of 19, uh, uh, let's see, uh, 83, 88, and 93. Um, and there's one exception, which is claimed to produce an inequality measure uh, within countries overall on an annual basis, and that is uh, Xavier Sala E. Martin's paper, uh, which claims to find that inequality has been steadily declining. That paper is based upon uh, a World Bank, a data set authored by two staff members at the World Bank, Klaus Deininger and Lynn Squire, which has become a standard reference, uh, a bibliographic compilation of measures of household income inequality, or not strictly of household income inequality, measures of inequality uh, in the world economy. Uh, and that's the source material for Sally e. Martin. Well, the problem that we have is that upon examining the uh, core data set, which has been in use for uh, presenting measures of inequality within countries, we find that uh, important questions have to be raised. And I want to, first of all, pose a couple of questions that should be asked, it seems to me, about data sets when you don't know uh, anything in particular about how good they are in advance. Uh, first question you would want to know is how much of the territory is covered and how consistently? In other words, how much of the world over how many years? And secondly, it might be nice to know whether the numbers can reasonably be expected to be, first of all, accurate and secondly, comparable to each other. And I'm going to raise some questions about the, um, uh, the Dininger and Squire data set that will, I hope, persuade you that it's at least worthwhile to look further and see if there, isn't, if there aren't alternative sources of information. Um, if you look at the coverage, uh, it might be a good idea if someone could turn out the lights in the room just to make it a little bit more visible to the people in the back. Is that possible? Um, yeah. Um, if you look at the coverage, I've displayed the coverage of the what Dininger and Squire call the high quality subset of their data set on a map uh, showing the number of observations uh, where an observation is a year for a country uh, available for the entire period for which they have information from 1950 through the late 1990s. And what you can see is that while there are a few countries for which uh, information is available on an almost annual basis, that tends to be more true of several rich countries, the United States, Britain, Taiwan, Japan. Uh, India is not in such bad shape. But for most of the world, you have many fewer observations than that. And for most of the developing world, you have fewer than 10 observations over almost a half century's time. And in many cases, it's actually uh, considerably worse than that. You're relying on one or two or three observations for many countries, including almost all of Africa. Uh, it's also data which has curious uh, problems of inconsistency across space. 
And I've tried to illustrate that on this map in a very simple way by simply averaging across time, ignoring whatever patterns there may be in the historical uh, trends just to get you an idea of the kinds of uh, measurement patterns that they present over the world economy over this period. Uh, and two things that emerge very clearly are the relative heterogeneity of the European case and the relative homogeneity of the Asian case. What I've done here is to take the, to call the low, lowest third red and orange, the middle group yellow and green, and the highest group uh, light blue and dark blue, so you can get a sense of the, uh, of the patterns in the data. But here it is slightly blown up for Europe, and what you can see is that, for example, France and Italy are shown in this data as having inequality measures which are dramatically higher uh, than those of the immediately surrounding countries. Uh, something which seems to me to be um, a little bit difficult to credit on a priori grounds. That is to say, if it were true, since we know that France and Germany have average incomes which are very Similar, if it were true that the variances were as different, you might expect to find low-wage French workers migrating to Germany in order to do low-wage work, because there would be a gain in that. But if you, it's a test you can do yourself. If you go out on the streets at, of Hamburg at 5 o'clock in the morning and listen to the street sweepers, it seems to me very improbable that they will be speaking French. Uh, so that seems to me to at least raise questions about whether data collected in this particular way, which is essentially a bibliographic compilation of a range of studies done by official and semi-official groups at the national level, has in fact gotten you an international data set, which is a reliable comparative study. And on the Asian side, you have the opposite problem in that the Dininger and Squire data set tends to show low inequality measures for not only China, but also such countries as India and Indonesia, lower, in fact, than for Japan and Australia. Uh, and that also, given the enormous disparity and differences uh, in the national economic systems, seems to me to be at least eyebrow raising. When I raise this question at the World Bank, uh, the answer I got was that this was accounted for by the highly agrarian character of the, particularly the Indonesian economy um, and the relative equality of the agrarian society, but that only raises the question of why in the case of Africa, which is even more agrarian, do Dininger and Squires measures show a much higher uh, inequality estimates for most countries of sub-Saharan sub Africa for which they have data. So the whole thing seems to be uh, at least um, questionable it is well known that in the Asian region, you're mainly relying on expenditure rather than income surveys. So this is not, in fact, quite comparable data. Uh, but uh, the question of what adjustment one should make still then has to be addressed. <clears throat> if one looks again at the, uh, at the uh, Dininger and Squire data set, one problem which has been extensively pointed out in the literature uh, is, in fact, the uh, a heterogeneity of the data sources on which they are obliged to rely uh, simply because of the basic unavailability of consistent alternatives. So while uh, a large part of their measures are gross household income, they are also relying on net expenditure, on net income, sometimes on person per person gross income, sometimes on per person net income. And so you have a essentially a melange, one might even say a dog's breakfast, of different kinds of statistics, uh, and raising, again, an important question about what adjustments, if any, one should make uh, to, uh, uh, to put them on a comparable basis. It's a problem which is not only true within country, uh, between countries, but also within, within them. This is the Dininger and Squire measures for Spain showing a sharp drop in inequality uh, between uh, the early and, and the late 1970s, which is the time when Franco died and Spain uh, became democratic. So one might expect some such effect. But on the other hand, there's also a shift from a household gross income to a household net expenditure survey. And it's extremely possible that at least part of the decline in measured inequality in Spain is simply a, a, a reflection of 
of the different kinds of data that are being collected in the 1980s. Uh, and it's very hard to know a priori, again, what to do about that. If one takes <coughs> the World Bank's data set for the OECD countries, about which one has, I think, very reasonable prior expectations about what to believe, uh, and here we've mapped it out across um, uh, basically from left to right is from the low inequality countries to uh, the high inequality countries uh, in their data. And again, I think you can see uh, some things which ought to strike you as somewhat puzzling, in particular the fact that Sweden, Norway, and Denmark, the Scandinavian countries, appear in the middle of their distribution for Europe, with Spain in the lower range, uh, something which it seems to me flunks the airport test which is to say, fly to the country, drive in to the capital city from the airport, and see how much inequality you observe. Uh, the, uh, um, <clears throat> it's particularly good in the developing world, uh, but it does seem to me that uh, a reasonable expectation for Europe would be that credible data should show the Scandinavian countries with relatively low inequality measures, and that just doesn't happen to be true of the data set that Dininger and Squire and the World Bank have been uh, uh, at, describing as a high quality data set. So that's where we come in. We're the University of Texas Inequality Project and we are dedicated to finding extremely inexpensive but we hope reliable ways of adding to the stock of information about inequality on the global scale. Uh, we have been first of all involved and coming up with measures of pay inequality uh, at the global scale using data sets uh, that um, we acquired from the United Nations, basically uh, the United Nations industrial statistics. So for a large part of our work, uh, we have been restricting ourselves to the very small part of the economy uh, that is represented by manufacturing pay inequality. We've been applying very simple techniques that have the advantage, their only advantage, that they do permit us to measure things on an up-to-date basis at extremely low cost. Um, as I said a minute ago, we use international data sets for global comparisons, especially UNIDO's industrial statistics, but we go beyond that as well. Uh, as time and resources have permitted, we've been adding to it um, regional and national data sets including uh, Europe's Regio data set, which enables us to measure inequality across European regions. Um, we've been using national data sets from Goskomstad in Russia, uh, from the China State Statistical Agency, from the Annual Survey of Industries in, the United, uh, in India, and from a large number of data sources, including the local area personal income statistics in the United States. And we have published papers on almost all of those topics, and some of which I uh, make available to the center and leave for you here. But today I'm going to largely restrict myself to the international comparison and its derivatives, which are based, as I say, initially on UNIDO's industrial statistics. Our method is to use the between groups component of Tiles T statistic, um, which is um, a very easy thing to compute um, and which is facilitated in international comparisons by the existence of standardized categories, that is to say, standardized industrial classification schemes, which UNIDO and also Eurostat provide. And with those classification schemes, we are able to compute a cross-industries measure of inequality from the UNIDO industrial statistics with over 3,200 cross-country observations. This is the mathematics of it, and what we are basically using is the between groups component of Tiles T statistic. Tiles T statistic has a very lovely property of being disaggregable into between groups and within groups. If you have a group structure, if you know the inequality within each group, which is this term, you can weight it by income and sum it, get a between groups measure, a within groups measure. The between groups measure simply depends upon the population weight and on the ratio of the group average income to the global average times the log of the same thing. And since we do not have information on what's going on within our groups, within our industrial sectors, for example, we're basically restricting ourselves to the between groups measure, which turns out, however, to be a very robust 
estimator of the change in the shape of the whole distribution over time if you're sampling on a consistent basis. And to our surprise, we also discovered, and I'll try to persuade you of this, uh, that it is a pretty good estimator of comparative inequality across countries so long as things are measured on the same basis. I'll move on to the last mathematics I'll bother you with, but I'll turn you turn first to the question of how much information you can get on this admittedly very limited economic quantity, that is to say, inequality of pay in the manufacturing sector. And the answer is, if you're willing to narrow your focus, you can greatly expand your range. Uh, and for the period 1963 to 1999, we have a great many countries for which we have essentially annual observations, so we're able to construct dense and consistent time series and only a few countries in areas where manufacturing sectors are very weak to non-existent for which data is not, ex uh, not available at all. If you look then at the next question is, okay, so you've got this measure, is it any good? Why should anybody pay attention to it? Uh, I'm going to approach that through a series of, of illustrations. And the first one is to take two countries, the US and the UK, for which we know the income inequality data are dense and reasonably good, uh, and they are on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, you have our uh, measures, and what you can see is that while they are not identical, they are really quite similar in terms of their patterns. So what's going on in industrial pay in the US and the UK is broadly reflective of what's going on in an overall measure of income inequality. That's not. What's on the vertical axis? Uh, in, uh, on the left-hand side, it would be, um, okay, let me see. Uh, here it's a, uh, uh, sorry, I, I misspoke. On the top side, USA and UK, a Gini coefficient, and on the bottom side, the top is different. So it's just looking at the time pattern of the two, uh, of the two series in comparison. Looking at the movement of our inequality measure over time for a number of places, one of the things that we find is that uh, they do tend to correspond, sometimes in quite dramatic ways, to known historical events. So for example, we take our measures for China and Hong Kong, and you can see a turning point which is very clear at 1989, which happens to be uh, the moment of the, Tiananmen, the June 4th incident in Tiananmen Square and a subsequent uh, slowdown in the Chinese economy. If you look at Iran and Iraq, rather topical uh, choices, and I've always liked this graph because I don't think the CIA has it, um, <laughs> you can see that inequality in Iraq actually declined in the 1970s. The same was not true of Iran until 1979 when the Iranian numbers came down very sharply because the middle class was executed. Um, and <coughs> um, I mean the upper class was executed, excuse me. Uh, and then, of course, during the war, both countries were mobilized. The inequality numbers stayed quite compressed until the end of the war when they go up again. Uh, looking at inequality in the southern cone of Latin America, we find that there is a turning point in Chile, which is rather starkly located in 1973. There's one in Argentina in 1976, obviously both dates of military coup d'etat. The two countries... Um, diverge, Chile is blue and Argentina is green in this thing, the moment of the Philip Falklands War in 1982, which was also the moment of a severe banking crisis uh, in Chile. Uh, if you look again in North America, actually inequality in the United States goes, starts rising in the early 1970s. For this data, we have much more detailed data for Mexico. Uh, we see a substantial bump. Uh, so this is by no means the best estimate, but we see by a substantial bump in 1986 at the moment of the Deleuze Madrid crisis and the entry into the gap. Um, if you look at some places in the world, again in Scandinavia, uh, actually there's very little change in the data. So it's not true that inequality has been rising everywhere. In Denmark, it's actually been falling according to these measures. Uh, however, a little bit to the south and east in Central Europe, you can see a pattern of stability until the collapse of the uh, communist regimes in 1989 and then an enormous increase in every uh, country for which we have continuous measurement. If you do the same exercise 
uh, that I described earlier across space, you find actually the opposite pattern from what you see in the World Bank data. Um, looking at Europe, we actually find the European measures to be very consistent with each other. The broad sort of global scale discrepancies no longer exist. The Russian data are post-1991. They would be very different if you included the Soviet period. But otherwise, it's 1963 to 1999. East and Northern Europe low, with some gradient toward increasing inequality as you go toward the south. In Asia, on the other hand, we find a very high level of heterogeneity, a great deal of disparity, with China and Australia coming in as low inequality countries, but India and Indonesia coming in as high inequality countries in this measure. Um, and uh, we think at least that it's reasonable to expect an area which is economically highly integrated to have similar inequality measures, whereas an area which is highly uh, disintegrated not integrated, uh, could be expected to display more heterogeneity. So we find uh, that that's a more, uh, if you like, plausible arrangement than the reverse one. I also want to show you something which can't be done at all with the Dininger and Squire data, but with the uh, very large number of observations that we have, we can also track the changes in our data across countries and through time. Uh, and I can do this with a scale on a series of maps that run from brown, red to brown for the largest decreases in inequality, light to dark blue for the very largest increases. Uh, and if you just look at the map for the 1960s, for which we don't have a whole lot of data, you can see that it's, uh, it's a quite a diverse picture, actually. Quite a few regions of the world where inequality is decreasing, a few others where it's increasing, no terribly uh, interpretable pattern, but as the data set becomes more dense and times move, move on, you can begin to see some things that are quite distinctive. In the 1970s, at the moment of the oil boom, we have a consistent pattern of declining inequality in the producing countries and rising inequality in most of the consuming countries, uh, which are going, of course, through oil-induced recessions at this period. Uh, as we move into the late 1970s and the 1980s, the pattern changes mostly toward very strong increases in inequality concentrated initially in Latin America, with a significant exception in China and India, which are not affected by the global debt crisis uh, and the global recession, which is hitting all the rest of the developing world at this time. Uh, and as you move along into the 1990s, you find the pattern of rising inequality becomes most intense uh, in the area of the former Soviet Union its neighbors, uh, and China, with, again, a significant exception, uh, which is in Southeast Asia uh, at a moment of economic boom driven by foreign direct investment. So in what I'd call the age of globalization, uh, you have a distinct pattern of rising inequality uh, in most of the world, but again, uh, with, with, with a regional exception. Now. A couple of broad generalizations. First of them has to do with what light our data might be able to sh shine on the uh, ancient and venerable Kuznets hypothesis um, <coughs> of a relationship between the level of income and the level of inequality in the development process. Kuznets, of course, argued that in the process of a transition to an industrial society, inequality would tend first to rise, and then as uh, industrialization deepened and as you move toward the institutions of a welfare state, but also as low wage agriculture became a smaller and smaller part of the total workforce, inequality would then begin to decline. This is uh, a touchstone for almost every paper that's written on the inequality issue, uh, and most of the recent work uh, which has been based upon the Dininger and Squire work, has uh, thoroughly rejected the Kuznets hypothesis, has taken it as uh, mistaken in its application to the modern world. Uh, and as a result, uh, most of the current literature has moved off into a consideration, which I consider to be quite improbable on the face, of relationships between uh, the initial state of inequality and subsequent rates of growth with some 
economists arguing that low inequality is good for later growth, and other economists arguing that high inequality is good for later growth, and with theoretical models being cooked up to justify one position or another. Uh, we, what we believe, though, is that that recent trend of the literature is essentially inconsistent with a finding of a stable relationship between the level of income and the level of inequality, uh, and therefore depends upon the trustworthiness of the conclusion that the original Kuznets hypothesis no longer has a foundation in fact. But when you look at data which are restricted again to pay, which was after all what Simon Kuznets was principally interested in, and he explicitly ruled out adding in transfers and other forms of income, uh, what we find is that in our data, there is a very consistent, continuing, downward sloping relationship between income and inequality. Countries which are wealthier, this is a regression plane, uh, countries which are wealthier tend to have lower inequality measures. So I've got the, uh, the Powell statistic on the vertical axis, GDP per capita going this way, and I've also added in a time trend, uh, which points to a second uh, interesting fact from this very simple linear regression, and that is that the plane has been tilted upwards over the past 35 or 36 years. That is to say there has been a tendency for this downward sloping Kuznets relationship to be shifting out over time. Now that's not the best way to look at this um, analysis, particularly given the fact that we have a data set now with 3,200 observations from which we can construct uh, a panel and to which we can apply a, uh, um, a, uh, uh, a panel uh, data analysis with fixed effects covering both countries and time and controlling for GDP per capita. And when you do that and look at the time effects, uh, what you find is, I think, very interesting. These are the time effects from, as I say, a two-way fixed effects model uh, showing, in other words, that part of the movement of inequality in our data which is consistent across countries, which is, in a sense, the global movement of, between, of within countries' inequality, essentially stable from 1963 through the end of the decade, then a period when there was a pattern of decline, that is to say, of falling inequality in the world economy, and then an enormous turnaround in 1970, 1980, 81, 82, with 20 years of steady increases afterwards. And when I look at that data and apply what I believe I know about the history of the world economy to it, I say, I think I am observing here a, <coughs> the, 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 if you like, the uh, cloud chamber trail of the change in the global financial system that occurred during this period. Uh, that is to say, not liberalization, not increasing trade, not globalization in the technological sense, but rather the changes in the pattern of global financial governance and macroeconomic policy, uh, which occurred during this period. In particular, the 1960s were the last decade of the successful stabilization of the world economy under the Bretton Woods institutions. In the 1970s, those institutions were dismantled. You had first a commodities boom and then a debt boom, both of which would drive up the growth rates of developing countries and tend to reduce their inequality exactly as the Kuznets hypothesis would predict. Uh, and then uh, the massive turnaround uh, with the return to uh, uh, very high interest rates and the subsequent debt crises uh, beginning with Mexico in 1982, quickly spreading from there to the rest of Latin America and eventually around the world. And with that, you can see an increase in inequality that is global in scope and it seems to me that that points very strongly to problems of global macroeconomic governance as being at the heart of the question, something which is quite different from what the literature largely has maintained, which is that each country, through its choices of institutions and policies, can control its own destiny as far as inequality is concerned. This evidence would suggest that if, they are, if that is true, they are doing so in a remarkably coordinated way. It's also true that if you take Milanovic's 
measure of unweighted between countries inequality and look at the time pattern of that, and that's the inset, one measured with Africa and the other without, uh, it's essentially the same pattern. That is to say stability, some decline in the 1970s, and then steady increase from 1980 onward. And that suggests to me that we're picking up, uh, we're both picking up essentially different aspects of the same phenomenon a rise in, if you like, the inequality of a worldwide distribution, which is to say that boundaries are simply a way of observing things, and anything that's happening within countries should also be happening between them, uh, and that is what we appear to be uh, uh, observing with this information. Okay, let me turn now, I'll skip over that. Let me turn now to the final piece of analysis, and I'll take uh, another five or ten minutes, and then... Uh, be ready to have questions. It's obvious that there is something quite unsatisfactory about comparing uh, a measure that is very narrowly focused on the between industries component of manufacturing pay with a measure of income inequality broadly spoken and broadly conceived. And of course, development economists tend to be concerned with the broadest measure of income inequality because that's more closely associated with economic welfare. So the question then comes up, what is the relationship between the two measures? And that's the basis of the paper that we're about to publish in which we did some estimating of the relationship between our tile measures and the Gini coefficients in the Dininger and Squire data set. And having said all the things I've said in a disparaging tone about Dininger and Squire, I have to take some of them back because it turns out with some very simple regressions we can explain almost 60% of the variation in Dininger and Squire in a matched sample of almost 500 observations. So uh, what we do here is we take our measure of, of, of pay inequality, that's the tile, uh, we add in a measure of the weight of manufacturing in the economy, manufacturing employment over total population, and we've also looked at urbanization and population growth as possible explanatory variables. Um, and <coughs> we also then add in dummy variables to account for the various different types of data in the Diner and Squire data set, which turn out to be a very significant uh, uh, factor. Um, but what we find is that our measure is very consistently and stably in different specifications related to the Diner and Squire measure. So it's not bad as an instrument. And with that realization, and with the realization that uh, inequality tends to be inversely related to the share of manufacturing, uh, and that you can estimate with considerable precision the effect of the different types of uh, data in Dininger and Squire on uh, the inequality measures, it seemed to us reasonable to use our larger data set as instruments to fill in the gaps and to produce a data set which is an estimated data set of household income inequality using the, uh, using the coefficients basically. Uh, as, and we settled on this model uh, as the one which is stablest, let's say two variable model uh, with uh, just the, uh, our inequality measure and the share of manufacturing plus the dummy variables for the various data types. And when you do that and then project out, for example, over the OECD countries to give you a, uh, a, a, a comparison that I, uh, with the graph I showed earlier, you find that in our data set, well, gee, it's true, Sweden, Denmark, Finland, and Norway are in the low range for Europe. The Mediterranean countries, Spain, Greece, Portugal, are in the high range. The USA is roughly where it is in the uh, uh, Luxembourg income studies, that is to say, someplace in the same vicinity as Italy and Spain, France uh, and uh, um, Australia and some other places in, in the middle. If you look at how our data match up to Dininger and, to Dininger and Squire across the world, it turns out we're quite close to them in some areas, but we generally think that their measures for sub-Saharan Africa and for Latin America, the Middle East, are on the high side, whereas for South Asia uh, and for uh, Eastern Europe, 
we think their measures are slightly on the low side. Uh, I could go in. I think I'll skip over the, 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 the major detailed listing of the outliers, uh, but we're particularly skeptical about the measures for uh, sub-Saharan Africa, including South Africa, uh, where we think that there, if it is true uh, that inequality is um, 10 to 20 points higher in Gini points than um, our, uh, our, our model would predict, some reason for that would have to be um, forthcoming. So far, we haven't seen one but we're particularly nervous about their measures because it turns out, in fact, that for 16 sub-Saharan African countries, they only have a total of 19 observations. So you're operating with basically one survey per country, and it's very hard to say uh, how reliable they were. If you look at um, the trends in the Dininger and Squire data, uh, you can see that basically they do not find any strong trend in global inequality. I've divided it up into... OECD and non-OECD countries. Um, but, and the movement in the data is an artifact in part of the extreme variation in sample selection from one year to the next. That variation persists if you look at our data and in the, the matched sample to Dininger and Squire because, of course, again, we, we, we're basically imposing the sample selection problem onto our data set. But if you look at our data set as a whole, you get a very clear picture of the pattern across the world uh, in which uh, the inequality is rising in the OECD countries from the um, late 1970s onward and strongly in the non-OECD countries from at least the middle to the end of the 1980s. There's a pattern breaking out according to income level. I'll just skip over that. I will show you one more and that is uh, income inequality as we see it in North America and as they see it uh, this is the Dinergy and Squire measures for the U.S., Canada, and Mexico, showing Mexico with an extraordinarily high 20-point inequality gap with the United States, but also a decline in the late 1970s. Uh, U.S. and Canada pretty close together. If you take our measures, we actually show Mexican inequality to be only about 10 points higher than in the U.S., about 10 points less than we would find for Brazil, for example. So we think Mexico is actually an intermediate case, not in the same inequality league as Brazil. And we tend to find that inequality declined in Mexico until the advent of the debt crisis, then increased sharply uh, through the debt crisis, peaking in the, unfortunately, Mr. President, the first year of your administration when the effect the of... The first week. The first week. The first week the first week of your administration as a direct result of the collapse of the peso. Uh, and we find a very consistent pattern, actually, for a lot of developing countries that a currency crisis and a depreciation drives a wedge between the incomes of those who sell to an export market and those who sell to the internal market. And that's going to have a significant effect on our data. And then, as you say exactly, uh, in the subsequent period, there is uh, a measurable improvement, for which I can only say you look at the pattern in the United States, you were certainly swimming against the tide. Uh, so with that, I will conclude and thank you and ask for questions. I'll just say one other thing. You can get a lot more information from our website. If you don't want to write down the address, all you have to do is to type inequality into Google. Uh, <coughs> you will get uh, references to about, last time I did it, 3.2 million websites. Uh, and we were listed number four. Uh, uh, which was particularly good considering that we were one or two places ahead of Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Uh, so, thank you very much. Sure. Um, if you look, I think, at the pattern of trade, 
um, in the post-war period, it is rising relatively rapidly throughout the period, and I believe it is rising more rapidly than income in the first 25 years after the Second World War. Uh, but it's not producing the systematic pattern of rising inequality in our data. Uh, whereas after 1980, it is. Uh, and that suggests to me that um, the effects of trade are per se ambiguous. Uh, whereas the effects of um, macroeconomic instability are fairly consistent. And since you have a global pattern, a global shift of, uh, for example, the real interest rate from a negative value in, throughout most of the 1970s to a strongly positive value from early 1980s onward, um, it's one of my father's laws, Galbraith's second or third law, uh, is that those who have money to lend tend to have more money than those who do not have money to lend. <laughs> uh, and uh, an implication of that is that those who have money to lend tend to be better off when interest rates are high. Uh, and that uh, would, would tend to, to play into this um, story. But beyond that, uh, it's clear that with the macroeconomic crisis, uh, a great many countries came to the end of an import substituting industrialization pattern uh, and dismantled protection and as a result, drove down their, uh, the, the relative incomes of their middle classes. So you had a crisis for industrial classes. Uh, that's going to have an increasing, effective increasing inequality, but to some extent it's offset, and I would suspect it was offset in the Mexican case, by the rising industrialization of the export sector. So that if you have those two things going on at the same time, uh, the effect of trade per se on inequality in a developing country is going to be, it seems to me, at best ambiguous. Is there a systematic difference? I hadn't thought about it. Okay. The, uh, the, the, the point is that when you're estimating genies from deciles and quintiles, you'll get an, another systematic element of difference. Yeah. Right. Uh, just the people who are not getting paid mm -hmm. in, the, in the informal sector and most important the agricultural sector. Right. And that, uh, you said, economists like to look at the whole economy. You're right. looking at a piece of it. And you're lucky to have a high correlation with the genie. In fact, I got a little confused because that genie is fine, fine genie. It's right. a little bit, uh, a little bit ambiguous and which you really like. And it has worked with the genie. And the genie has the Well, that's the tile. It's, that's, that's, that's beautifully decomposable. The genie is only approximately so. Right, and that's true. Um, and my, I'll give you a metaphorical justification, then I'll give you a, a, a deeper one. The metaphorical justification is I could come into this room every day at noon 
and just look from here out the window and tell you what the weather is. I don't need to see the whole sky. Right? And if I'm looking for changes, and this has to do with, if you like, the fractal character of uh, a distribution, I, it's self-similar at different scales, and if I'm looking at the same piece of it in a consistent way, I, my argument is I can predict something about what's happening to the whole distribution. I may not be accurate in all cases, and I'll give you a very clear case of inaccuracy. If I'm looking at pay distributions in the United States in the late 1990s, I'm going to miss the enormous increase in income distribution that occurred because of capital income. True. You're not going to get everything. But the advantage is that you have a great many more observations that you've measured accurately and consistently. So it's a trade-off. I would also argue, though, that it's not as even as, it's, it's better even than that. And, that. and that is that in a pay distribution, let's say in manufacturing, uh, you have high income and low income workers. The high income workers will tend to be in petroleum and machinery. The low income workers will tend to be in food and beverages, let's just say. Uh, those food and beverages workers and the garment workers will tend to be relatively close substitutes for agricultural workers and service workers. Right? And if we see uh, a, an enormous increase in inequality as a result of a relative decline in the pay in those low-paid sectors, there are two possibilities. One is that there's an even greater decline in the piece that you haven't observed out there in agriculture and services. And the other is that there isn't. If there isn't, then the differential has to be narrowing, in which case workers will disappear from the low-wage industrial workers back into agriculture. And if there is, they won't. And in general, they don't. So my argument would be that typically a movement in the pay inequality that you can observe since the economy is not hermetically sealed, its different sectors are not hermetically sealed off from each other, is a pretty good instrument for what you can, um, uh, for what you can observe. Um, further thought on this is that there are countries for which we have broader data sets. Uh, we, have for, we have for Russia, we have for China, we have for India, we have for the, uh, for, well, not for India, we have for Europe, we have for the United States. Um, and so we can compare our measures where we can do it with the data uh, or with the, with, for manufacturing with the data for the larger industry, larger economic sectors. And you know, broadly speaking, the two measures are consistent. So on a lot of different grounds, I would argue that, uh, uh, that our, these measures are a useful instrument, not only for pay and manufacturing, but for what's going on in the broader economy. Not perfect, you're not gonna get everything right. Probably the movement is larger, it's certainly larger than the movement in an overall income distribution, but the chances of them going in opposite directions um, I mean, we, we have identified some cases where they do, but the chances in general of it happening are, are not nil, but they're relatively small. So from that standpoint, we feel that the neglect of these measures has been uh, a, uh, a failing, and that, again, Deininger and Squire, whom I have a lot of respect for, but all they could do was to take the historical record of past studies and bring them all together as best they can uh, and they're going to run into the problem that the studies are done in different ways and the resulting measures are going to have all kinds of incomparabilities in them and that's what we've observed. Yes, I think it would be. For economic yeah, I think it would be. Um, I, I think your, your two choices are financial regionalization uh, and, um, and capital control. Uh, and here's where I really come down in the middle between the anti-globalizers who say it's trade and therefore we should restrict trade um, and the pro-globalizers who say everything is fine. Uh, it seems to me that those cases which did the best in the past 20 years, China and India, are clearly distinguished 
by the fact that they were not engaged in the global uh, commercial financial market and therefore were insulated from the shocks of the 1980s. And China managed to parlay that into a 7 to 10 percent growth rate consistently from then to the present, India into about a 4 percent growth rate. And the stability of that growth rate has been the major factor, it seems to me, in the reduction of poverty and the general progress of both places, notwithstanding that both of them have had increases in inequality internally. Um, the, uh, uh, the problem of small countries or countries which are already deeply integrated into uh, the uh, global financial community is something that has to be addressed in a different way. Uh, but here, it seems to me that there is a lesson which is only now being assimilated from Europe. And was, I think, an unexpected effect of uh, the Euro. European performance through the 1990s after the Maastricht Treaty was de deplorable. Unemployment rose across Europe by about four percentage points, and we've, we've done a paper on that. But in the late 1990s and in the early part of this decade, as the Euro took effect, you began to see a boom in Spain, in Portugal, in Greece, in the peripheral countries of Europe. I don't know anybody with the possible exception of Paniotopoulos who anticipated it. Uh, and Pan's argument, which is straightforward, which is that the creation of a currency that cannot depreciate eliminated exchange rate risk and therefore the distinction between tradable and non-tradable goods so far as Europeans were concerned making it possible to bank construction activity and service expansion in countries where credit would not be expanded before to nearly the same extent because of the risk of loss or exchange rate risk. So it eliminated the bias toward manufacturing which had afflicted the peripheral countries. Uh, and that caused a, an absorption of, of up to 10% of the labor force in Spain. Uh, in the case of Mexico, it's of course very clear you have that bias all along the border. It's a, it, I, I've taught in Monterey, and uh, you know, all the, the, the bright kids that you encounter, they want to be in the manufacturing sector. You know, that's, where, that's where the secure dollar income is. Uh, and uh, that, so it, it seems to me one way or the other, one can move toward progress. Uh, but in a situation in which you have countries which, then, which develop, and then, as the Asian countries were in 1997, as Mexico was in 1995, hit with crippling exchange rate crises, your living standards slip backward on an almost arbitrary basis. And it's hard to imagine that that could be efficient for deciding how to allocate resources in a, in a, in a world of trade, because you can't predict what the factory prices are going to be. Yeah, the question mm. is that. I always argued about NAFTA that the main effect of NAFTA was on the attitude of the United States toward Mexico and that it would create, and I argued at the time before the 95 crisis, that it was a good idea because it would create an environment where the U.S. would react more favorably and more rapidly in the next crisis. Um, the, uh, but the, the difficulty I have with accepting the domestic explanation for all countries is that if it were true, I would expect a more random pattern. Instead, I see a, a systematic global pattern of rising inequality, which is keyed to the major transition in the governance of the world economy around 1980, where there was a domestic policy change, but it was in the United States. It was in the conduct of monetary policy. Uh, but that had global ramifications. 
And when you have such a, an evident global instrument, the interest rate in world markets set essentially by the Federal Reserve, um, it seems to me hard to overlook the pressure that puts uh, vulnerable countries in, in, into. And you have, the, you have the, also the case of the Asian crisis, where, the, where it's hard to argue in a consistent way that there were clear-cut domestic policy mistakes of the same kind across all the countries. You had a single uh, 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 wave of, of retreat of capital from the region in spite of a very great diversity of policy. And basically, people didn't know or didn't care whether Korea was different from Indonesia. They were, they were reacting to the fact that everybody else was reacting to the, uh, to the flight from Asia generally. And so to, to my mind, a, stable, a set of stabilizing institutions which would prevent those forces from affecting small countries would enable them to begin again to have some of the experience that big developing countries, that China, for example, has been able to maintain. And that, why are China and India successful in this case? I mean, one, one clear reason, it seems to me, is that they're so big that they can maintain their own position. They are not necessarily selling themselves on the world market in order to, for example, become uh, an insurance capital, as, as Bangkok wanted to become, or Kuala Lumpur wanted to become, uh, and felt that if they, if they gave certain concessions, they would get a, a degree of, of, an, of, of inflow that, the, that other countries would not have. And that seems to me to be the kind of problem, the co competition for the, for, the low, for the worst kind of, of investment dollar that afflicted the, the, the smaller countries of Asia. Well, I said to Paul Davidson, who, as you know, is an opponent of the Tobin tax, because he says it won't work, uh, because it doesn't, it hasn't a big enough effect um, to, uh, it isn't big enough and to, to stop the kind of gross movement that we're talking about. And I said, Paul, but I favor it even though it won't work. Uh, and the reason is that, to me, it it's more symbolic than anything else. It represents a symbolic willing, willingness of the advanced countries uh, to uh, accept the legitimacy of control over capital flow. Uh, and if the advanced countries accept the Tobin tax, then they have to accept the Chilean uh, approach to capital flow or the Chinese approach or almost anything in between. Uh, or for example, it's very much harder for them to reject the Sakaki Barra Asian Monetary Fund and my view is that we need to build institutions essentially at all kinds of levels in order to stabilize. Uh, and the Tobin tax, well, it, it should not be a substitute for those, but it could be a way forward uh, to acceptance for them. 